Our gospel lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, and then we're going to be jumping to verses 43 to 48. I invite you, as you're able, if you'll please stand, let us honor the reading of the gospel this morning. And here Jesus is teaching what will be known as the Sermon on the Mount to a crowd of people, including the disciples. And here he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We're finishing up today the second part of our two-part two sermon series uh, called Politics and the Pew, Being Disciples in a Divided Time. And I want to thank you all for uh, your patience and for your willingness uh, to hear uh, these words. It is uh, quite a, a risk uh, to take as a pastor to announce I'm going to be preaching on politics and live to tell the tale after the first sermon. So, um, But I want to do this because I do think this is something the church needs to be on the forefront of. Uh, you notice one of your bulletin inserts uh, is a half-page insert called Building Skills for Dignified Conversations. This is for you to take home, and this is a resource from the Church of the Resurrection, uh, which is in Leewood, Kansas. The lead pastor there is Adam Hamilton. Many of you uh, know Adam Hamilton. You've done his uh, book studies. Uh, and this is a great resource, and this is just a simple list of ways that you can engage in maybe difficult or hard or challenging conversations. It's a way to kind of open up to uh, listening to others, respecting others, and also how to offer your own views as well. So I invite you to uh, take that home, put it on your refrigerator, or take it around with you, and uh, hopefully learn from that. And also this morning, I want to challenge you with a question that I'm going to invite you to share with people around you, uh, share your response to. Uh, this is a very pertinent, uh, relevant question, uh, especially in the next few weeks, because families are going to be gathering around the Thanksgiving table. And uh, let's just imagine that in the next few weeks, you're going to be gathering around the, the table for Thanksgiving, and your crazy Uncle Gus, you know, is going to be there, and uh, everybody has a crazy Uncle Gus in their family. I've got two or three in mind. I'll, I'll lend you some of mine if you would like, if you don't have one. And, uh, you know, there's always going to be that person around the table who's going to bring up politics. They're going to make a comment and say how great the election results were or how awful the election results were. And you're going to be stuck in the middle wondering, how am I going to respond? So I want you to take just a moment and kind of thinking back on Jesus' call for us to love God with all, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. How would you respond? What were some things you can do to set a Christ-like, respectful tone at the family dinner table in case an uncomfortable conversation comes up? What are some maybe some family rules that you can implement on that Thanksgiving? So 90 seconds and go.
And you have 30 seconds left, 30 seconds. All right, let's come back together, and I want to invite if anybody wants to share um, their answer, their response to how, what's a way you can set uh, a, an agreeable or a more Christ-like or inviting tone uh, in, in your family Thanksgiving settings. Start out with dessert. <laughs> What's that? How about them Dodgers? How about them Dodgers? Yes, Jane. Redirect the conversation. That's a good strategy. Yes, Jerry. Yes, recognizing the elections are over. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, great. You're you're setting healthy boundaries. Of saying you know the dinner table is for eating and discussing things that unite us and bring us together. So yeah. One more, yes. Yes, we need to be in prayer for our elected officials. Lord knows they need them. <laughs> they need our prayers. Uh, so thank you all for, for sharing that. Um, it is an understatement to say that our nation is deeply wounded by division. And often when lack, noticing this lack of common decency and morality in our public life, some Christians will declare, you know, we need to get this nation back to God. A statement that has a somewhat debatable assumption. Maybe that's for another sermon. But often uh, behind it is a sentiment that longs for an alleged time of innocence, usually hearkening back to the 1950s, early 1960s, to a golden era, supposedly, when everybody got along, uh, times were kinder and simpler for everybody. <laughs> Ask your African-American friends or your Jewish friends how kinder and simpler were those times for them. Kinder and simpler for who might be another question. And while such a view is a bit problematic, I think overall we can all agree that there is a sincere desire to be the better angels of our nature, to quote Lincoln. Which brings us to the question, so what is the role of the church in any nation? Certain Christian leaders say that Christians need to take over, take control, take charge, some loudly proclaiming, we need to get back to the Bible, which is quite interesting and a bit ironic because nowhere in the New Testament are Christians commanded to get involved in political power, take political power, get involved, take over the government. If you want scriptural advice on how to take over and run a government, you need to consult the Quran. The Quran has lots of things to say about taking over nations, but not in the New Testament. Nowhere does Jesus or any of the New Testament writers tell us how to run a nation. In fact, in the Gospels it is recorded that Jesus was tempted by Satan out in the wilderness and one of the things that Satan tried to entice Jesus with was to give him political power and Jesus said no. Because political power ultimately involves force or coercion. And Jesus never used force or coercion to get someone to follow him. So it's interesting and ironic that in the Gospels, Jesus refuses political power, but we in the modern church, we are often trying to grasp after and go after political power. We seek the very thing that Jesus rejected. With certain Christians declaring that the ballot box is now how God's will can be enacted and enforced, 
I want us to consider our two passages this morning that will hopefully bring light to this topic and to these circumstances. Adam Hamilton often says that Christians, we need to be known for bringing light to a situation. Often, sometimes we Christians are known for bringing heat to a conversation, but we need to be a people who bring light to a conversation. In our first lesson from Isaiah 58, Israel has been redeemed from Babylonian exile. They were taken by Babylon into exile, and now they have been freed. They are now freed to return home and to try to restore itself to its former glory. The exiles in Isaiah 58 have returned home, but home was still not home. Home was still in shambles. They long to restore Jerusalem to its former glory. They wanted to get the nation back to God, but they didn't know how. So what could they do to win back God's favor? How could they restore the greatness of their nation? Well, one of the things they did was they renewed their worship tried to rekindle their worship life with a special emphasis on prayer and fasting. And this seems to resonate with a lot of Christians in our nation today. Whenever Christians say, you know, we need, uh, our nation needs a revival. Uh, we need a spiritual reawakening. And depending on who you ask, that can mean a range of things. It can mean something like, Churches need to be holding more revival services in their communities. Others may see it as we need Christians to restore prayer and Bible reading back in the classroom in public school settings. Uh, or we need to get out the vote. Christians need to vote. Here's the thing when it came to Israel. That despite their fervent prayer meetings and their family devotion times, God's favor was withheld. Despite the increase in worship attendance and despite the number of hands that were raised and eyes that were closed and despite the amount of tears that were flowing in their worship services, the blessings of heaven did not rain down upon the land. Despite the nationwide fasting, the glory of Israel was not restored and the people wanted to know why. And in reply, in response to the people's question, God answers with a shout. And what does God say that Israel needs to do to be restored as a nation? Put prayer back in school? Ensure that only Christian prayer is allowed at town board meetings? Pass a law saying that only Merry Christmas will be said in December? What does God demand? of a nation that longs to be great? He tells them, is this not the kind of fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke, to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into your house, and when you see the naked, to cover them? Now this passage is not telling Israel or us what we need to do to earn our way back into God's graces, but more how we can experience the gracious presence of God. God is already in those places, but we don't really realize it until we combine true worship with genuine mercy and justice. Then, in the faces of the poor, we will hear God say to us, here I, here I am. Isaiah is declaring what Jesus echoes in the Gospels when he says that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. You were listening last week. That's great. God's people both then and now are called to be a positive influence in our world, to enact injustice and to embody mercy. In our gospel lesson, Jesus is preaching what we will know as the Sermon on the Mount. 
And he looks out at the crowds and he looks out at the disciples and he sees a bunch of ragtag fishermen whom he has called to follow him, learn from him, disciples whom he has not thoroughly taught yet. He's not had enough, a long time with them. He's not spent a long time uh, teaching them. They haven't been following him around for that long. And these are people who will display an amazing la lack of understanding. They will display a capacity to completely miss the point, to not get it, to not grasp his mission and his purpose. And Jesus looks at these people and says, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. Now, Jesus does not hand them a spiritual to-do list for them to go out and complete and turn back into him. He simply declares them to be salt and light. He calls them the light of the world. We're used to hearing Jesus referred to as the light of the world, but that's John's gospel. But here in Matthew's gospel, Jesus tells us we are the light of the world. Salt and light. Now, these are not just simply objects that Jesus picked out of thin air to use as examples. Salt and light were images that were very familiar to the people of the first century in, in his context. So let's look at salt. We need salt. Without salt, we would die. But if we have too much salt, it harms us. We could actually die from too much salt. Salt is one of the world's oldest spices. At one time, it was used as currency in the ancient world. In fact, that's where we get the word salary. It's derived from the ancient practice of paying workers with salt. Some of the earliest roads were built for the salt trade. Some of the earliest taxes were levied on salt. There have been military campaigns that were fought over the control of salt. Salt gave Venice its start as a commercial trading empire in Europe, and it helped Gandhi bring India to independence in the mid-20th century. Now, one statistic says that on average, Americans eat a little over a tablespoon of salt a day. I don't think that accurately reflects people in the South, because we would probably triple that statistic. Salt enhances flavor, and it brings out the best in food. And I'm just wondering if that may be the reason Jesus chose that example. The task of disciples is to bring out the best in others, to season our community. So I want us to think about that for a moment. Are we as a church, are you as a disciple of Jesus Christ, are we individually and collectively known for bringing out the best in others or for bringing out the best in our community? When Jesus declared that we are to be the salt in of the we are to be the salt in the world, I don't think he meant for us to overwhelm the world with our religiosity, with our judgmentalism, so that we oversalt things. Think about it, when you use salt in your food, there's a certain amount of salt that is just right. If you don't use enough salt, the, the, the food is bland. But if you use too much, then the food is inedible and you've got to throw it out. And notice this about salt. When you sprinkle it on your mashed potatoes or sprinkle it on your grits and you mix it in, notice it disappears, never to be seen again. And yet it changes what it has been mixed into. It changes the food. It brings the flavor to a different level. And notice that in order for salt to do its job, it has to be poured out. So too with us as disciples. In order for us to do our job, we've got to be willing to be poured out. We've got to be willing to, to give ourselves away, to disappear in our service. The call to give ourselves away and to disappear is a call to relinquish control, 
something that we humans, and particularly we religious folks, are hesitant to do at times. The late Anglican Bishop William Temple once said that the church, as far as he understands it, the church is the only institution that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. What if that were to be kind of our mission statement or our vision? We exist for the benefit of those who are not our members. Same thing with, with light. Light does not exist for itself or for its own purpose. The main purpose of light is to illuminate a certain area or a certain space, to light a path for people to see and to travel. Too little light and you won't be able to see where you're going. Also, you get that same effect when it's too much light. Light can blind you. You have to have just enough light and just enough salt. Jesus declares us to be salt and light, two things that do not exist for themselves. Until the last century or so, salt was used to preserve food. It did not exist to preserve itself or save itself, but was used to preserve something else. Same thing with the followers of Jesus. We exist for the purpose of bringing the best out in others to enhance our community and to preserve that which honors God and serves the common good. You are salt and you are light. You, with all your frailties and uncertainties, failures, broken promises, you with all of your doubts, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And Jesus tells us that whenever we encounter injustice or cruelty, be salt, be light. Last week we heard how Jesus commanded us that when we love God, that we love God when we love our neighbor. That when we are intentionally, tangibly loving our neighbor, even the neighbor we know is going to cancel out our vote we are somehow loving the God who made our neighbor. Now, contrary to what is being said by a lot of Christian leaders and personalities who have large followings on social media, God does not enact God's will through political elections. The kingdom of God is neither hindered nor advanced by a presidential election. The Bible declares that God indeed does rule, but God rules not at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, nor at 10 Downing Street, nor at the Kremlin, but rather the living God rules on a cross. God rules through the one who was betrayed and beaten and broken and crucified. God rules through the one who said to put away the sword. So our God rules not through coercive power, not by the power of the sword, but by the power of suffering love, the power of the cross. And those who follow the one true living God, we are to imitate this in our own lives. For years, we in the church, we have been tempted to join the so-called culture war by securing political power. But again, that is not the way of Jesus. Sure, do your civic duty. Go and vote. But folks, let's take a deep breath and relax. Evangelical pastor Greg Boyd has some great insight into understanding what it, what it means for us to be a, the church in this political divisive time. And he says this, the question that wins the world is not how can we in the church get our morally superior way enforced in the world, but rather the question that wins the world and the question that will define 
followers of Jesus Christ is how do we carry the cross for the world? How do we best communicate to others their unsurpassable worth before God? And he says, when the church wins the culture war, it inevitably loses. Because when it conquers the world, it becomes the world. When you put your trust in the sword, you lose the cross. Now maybe I've missed it, but whenever I read the New Testament, I can't find anywhere where someone became a committed follower of Jesus Christ by losing an argument. If you read the disciples and if you read early church history, the early church did not win people to Jesus by out-arguing their opponents. They won people over by out-loving them. I mentioned Adam Hamilton, lead pastor at Church of the Resurrection in Kansas. And one of the things that they do every year is they call the, the kindness campaign. They will adopt a, a phrase or something that they are to live into, kind of their vision for the year. And during the 2020 election season, they launched a Love Your Neighbor campaign as a way of being a countercultural witness to all the divisive rhetoric that was out there. And so they took that phrase and they put it as a hashtag, hashtag love your neighbor, and they put it on coffee mugs and t-shirts. But one of the things they did was they made yard signs with that phrase, love your neighbor, on it. And they encouraged all the church members to come by and pick up your love your neighbor church sign and put it in your yard and put that in your yard instead of a political campaign sign. Instead of letting people know your political affiliation, let them know, declare that you love your neighbor. And one member of the church was a guy who had a neighbor across the street uh, who just loved to rib him politically. Uh, and he put up political signs just to annoy his neighbor. And uh, it was clear that they were, they were just polar opposites. And the church member, when, whenever the church announced they were going to do this Love Your Neighbor campaign, the church member said, that's it. I'm going to go get a Love Your Neighbor yard sign. I'm going to put it in my yard directly across from my neighbor across the street, and I will show him who's more loving. <laughs> so he did that, put the, the yard sign in his yard, walked in the house. Later that day, he looked out across the street at his neighbor's yard, and he noticed his neighbor had taken down all of his political signs, and he too had put up a yard sign that said, love your neighbor. It was the exact same sign that he had gotten from the church. And the man couldn't believe it. So he got up and he walked across the street, walked up to his neighbor's door, said a brief prayer, and when the guy opened it, the neighbor said, uh, uh, I didn't know that uh, we must go to the same church. And I, I need to tell you something right now. I have not loved my neighbor as myself. So can you forgive me? And the neighbor thought for a moment. And then he said, I too have not loved my neighbor as myself. Can you forgive me? And in that moment, I bet both of them just felt so humbled, maybe to the point of humiliation, maybe to the point of being broken and poured out, which is exactly where they needed to be, imitating their Lord. And so it is for us today. Thanks be to God. Amen.